Hello, everyone, and welcome to 3 o'clock with Doc. Give me just a second so I can welcome our Spanish-speaking neighbors who need interpretation in Spanish. Buenas tardes. Gracias por estar aquí con nosotros a las tres en punto con SOC. Como siempre, ustedes pueden escuchar el programa en español a través de una llamada de conferencia. Y el número que hay que marcar aparece en la pantalla aquí, 646-749-3122. Y el código para entrar es 779-328-221. Also, please remember that the, these videos of our lives always are on our Facebook page and our YouTube page after the fact. So if you can't be with us at three on the dot, you can absolutely access these videos to see all of the information shared by our staff and our guests on our Facebook page and our YouTube page. I'm Gabe Charles. I am the Civic Engagement Manager here with you today. Uh, normally Thursdays are our coronavirus day with Marlene, but she is not feeling well, so we want to make sure she can rest up. Um, but she prepared a really great day for you all with some really awesome guests. So stay tuned. I'm sorry you're stuck with me another day this week, but we're going to get through it and it's going to be great. Um, just so everyone knows, our staff is still working virtually. We are not doing any activities in person to stay safe as the pandemic wages on. Uh, but you can give us a call. You can call us all the time at 414-672-8090. You can email us at sock at sockmilwaukee.org. And you can check out our website that has tons of information on all sorts of topics at sockmilwaukee.org. Uh, like I said, all of staff is working virtually from home, so that's why you don't see me wearing a mask. If we were at the office or working in any other setting outside of the home, we would absolutely be wearing our masks to adhere to these rules that are helping to keep us safe and to keep the cases down. So we're asking you all to do the same. Please, if you're going out, if you're going to be around people that you don't live with, wear those masks and let's get these cases down so we can start at the very least letting our kids go to school because we want to see these cases go down and we want it to be safe for our students. Um, please let us know who's here today. As we say every forum, we can see how many people are watching, but we can't see exactly who's watching. So give us a shout out in the comments. Let us know you're watching. Uh, give us a little smiley face, give us a like, give us a heart, whatever it is to let us know that you're here and watching with us. And remember that we welcome all questions throughout the forum. Uh, so any question that comes to your head, any comment that you want to make in the comments, we welcome those and encourage those. So please be, don't be shy and don't hesitate to ask anything in our comment section. I do want to share a quick disclaimer that the views and opinions shared today do not necessarily reflect those of stock. As Tammy always says, there are certain waters we can wade in and others that we can't. So we always just have to give that disclaimer. Um, but we're going to have really great topics for you all today. Like I said, today is the COVID-19 dedicated day of the weekly forum that we do or the daily forum that we do. Um, and today we're going to be talking about mental health awareness and specifically how COVID-19 and domestic abuse uh, have been connected during this time and how children are affected by domestic abuse or violence in the home and different steps that parents can take to help their child cope with domestic violence and trauma that comes from that violence. And we're gonna be talking with Carmen Petrie today from the Sojourner Family Peace Center. And we're really excited to talk with her. Later today, we will have Claire Evers come on, the Deputy Commissioner of the Environmental Health, and she'll be giving us an update on some COVID numbers and just what phase we're in as well. Tomorrow, you will also want to be with us. We're going to be talking with Dr. Monique Liston from Ubuntu Research and Evaluation. Looking forward to a really interesting conversation with her. Um, and yeah, it's going to be a great end to the week with her. So as I said, we have Carmen Petrie on with us today, and I'm going to go ahead and welcome her on. Hi, Gabe. Hello, hello. Thank you for being with us today. I'm honored to be here and um, to address this important topic. I had hoped that Mariana Rodriguez could be 
with me from the Latina Resource Center, but we'll get her on next time as well. Absolutely. To talk about this, this very important issue. Yeah, definitely. We, we would have loved to have her as well, but things always come up. Yep. So we'll, we'll definitely welcome her on another day as well. Um, the both of you are such a great team to have on here together. But we are absolutely happy to have you here as well. Um, Thank you. So yeah, why don't you just go ahead and, I know you've been on before, but we might have some viewers that didn't get to see those segments um, and maybe don't know much about the Sojourner Family Peace Center. So why don't you go ahead and give us an intro of you and the role that you play and the role that the organization as a whole plays in the community. So I'm the president and CEO of Sojourner Family Peace Center. We're right on the corner of Sixth and Wal uh, Walnut, right over the viaduct here, um, right on the other side of downtown. We uh, serve men, women, and children who've been impacted by domestic violence. We serve about almost 12,000 people a year, and we help them with uh, legal advocacy, restraining order assistance. If they are in the criminal court system, the family court system, we, we help them navigate pretty much all of the systems that start to operate when you've been impacted by domestic violence. We run a crisis shelter. We have a 43, well, 53 bed, but under COVID, we've capped our census at 43. Women, children, and men, we are offering shelter to men who have been battered or hurt in relationships. We have a crisis hotline, 24-hour hotline, which is 933-2722. And we do case management and individual support for people trying to rebuild their lives after violence has happened. So that's a brief overview. I um, I sort of steer strategically work with the board and you know have an exceptional staff, uh, 94 people who work here with us in partnership with many community organizations like Latina Resource Center and others who are working in domestic violence in Milwaukee. Amazing, thank you for sharing all of that. And mm -hmm. it always blows my mind when you say 94 people, it's just amazing that you're able to employ so many people with such an important need in the community. Um, so as I mentioned, we're gonna focus today on how witnessing or being a part of violence that happens in the home can traumatize children and how that can affect their mental health. So can you just go ahead and discuss how that uh, that trauma of witnessing violence like that can affect a child's mental health? First, I would say we have a brochure called Children, Family Violence and Trauma. And I'd be willing, we'd be willing to mail this out to anyone or to get them over to SOC if you want to distribute them. But if people want uh, a, a copy of the brochure, we, we tried to put together a resource for families who wanted to understand the impact of trauma on children. So the good and the bad news you know, is violence is a learned behavior. Uh, children learn by watching adults, that's not rocket science. If children are living lives that are filled with violence, they're, they're learning that violence is a strategy that you can use in your relationship. So that's the bad news. As kids are watching us as adults and when they live in violence, they may repeat that behavior and at the very least, they're going to struggle in a variety of ways. Domestic violence is traumatic for everyone in the home, even the pets, everyone is vulnerable when violence is happening. And so uh, children are innocent bystanders. They're witnessing, they know and see more than we want to believe they do. Um, they do um, uh, often are witnessing things that they uh, have a lot of difficulty integrating or interpreting. And it has a very traumatic impact on their sense of self and um, their sense of coping and how they're moving through the world. So we put together some uh, pieces of information we think is important to talk about. So a child who's living in violence may have a variety of impacts. You know, they may be what you may witness in the child. So, so first I wanna say it's important as adults, we understand that domestic violence has an impact on children. Sometimes it's right. hard for us to understand that because it, it, we don't wanna put our children in harm's way. But just by witnessing, uh, they are involved in the harm that's happening in the home. And I think we need to grapple with that. Um, so um, I think it's important for us to understand children here, they see and they're impacted. And some of the things we might see in children is they may be fearful, clinging, clinging to you, be terrorized, talking about being terrorized, needing constant support. They may um, regress 
in behavior, you know, so they may have progress and development, but regress when the violence starts to happening. Some of the things you might see are bedwetting, their heart rate down, they may, you know, lose bladder control in the midst of the trauma that's happening. They may become aggressive, they may throw tantrums, resist authority, shy away. So I think we should be looking at the um, the behavior that we're witnessing in kids when they live in violence. They may be embarrassed, they may feel guilty that it's their fault, they may think it's their fault, or feel like they have an obligation to solve the violence that's happening in the home. Um, they may, you know, as they get older, start to skip class, have a difficulty in school, engage in risky behavior as a way to self-medicate. I think people who are around trauma, you cannot survive trauma and not have to regulate regulate some way. And so sometimes people will use substances, food, alcohol, drugs, as a way to self-regulate the emotions that they, they don't know how to process or how to get through. And it can start as a, a at an early age. And so those are some of the reactions that children may have. Uh, as I said in the brochure, we we outline it more fully because I think it's important for us to understand that children may not have the words to say, I'm feeling this way or this is happening, or they may be too afraid to say that clearly, but their behavior will show uh, that they've been right? Yeah, and I think you mentioned a lot of uh, behaviors that we, that even teachers can identify, right, with kids in school. And I think a lot of times we expect to see acting out as one of the main ways that this this trauma might be uh, incorporated into a child's behavior. But I th is would you say that kind of internalizing and like regressing away from social uh, interaction? So like the quiet kid in the corner might just be experiencing just as much as someone that's acting out in front of the whole class or against the teacher. Absolutely. It could be a spectrum, right? We're all individual in how we process trauma and the way we walk through the world. So how I exhibit it may be very different than how you do, Gabe. And as adults, right. we should be on the lookout for the full spectrum of behavior. Mm -hmm. And then um, the good news for me is, you know, as adults, we have we we can be very powerful in the lives of children. Research shows that just one caring adult who makes time to listen to a child and how they're feeling can make a world of difference. That mm -hmm. children can survive trauma if they have someone in their life who can help them talk about it, process it, and move through the emotion. So I think that's very good news. I also believe that most of us as adults want to be there for our kids. Kids for right. me represent the future, right? We know we want to be there and we want to help them. And um, we, we want parents to know that they have the power to make an incredible difference, even if violence has happened in the relationship. You know, and some of the ways you can do that, uh, we have some tips on things you can do with your child or for your child. Um, so I, I want people, if they take nothing away from this conversation other than knowing the love you have for the child in your life can be a very important protective factor for that child, even if uh, violence has happened. That child can recover and you can heal and your family can heal. So some of the things that we recommend is making time for the children in your life, the child in your life, if it's one or, or multiple, spend time, give space for them, uh, be real about, you know, allowing them to express their emotions. We have a group called Child Witness to Domestic Violence. And I know Mariana does some programming over at, at Latina Resource Center. Uh, it's really important for kids to have opportunity, number one, to have fun and be kids, but then to express their emotions, their confusion, their say, their anger, their sadness, and just let that come up. Look for opportunities to praise your child, have positive connections, um, keep up your routines as much as possible, uh, play with your child, have some moments where you're connecting and having fun. Try mm -hmm. to keep your child, if you can, out of the middle of the family violence that might be happening. I think it's unrealistic for us to think that everybody who's going through violence is going to be able to leave immediately because that's not right. true. Sometimes survivors have to survive and their children are with them. And so it's important for them to be a voice to their children that says, this is not your fault. It's not your responsibility. 
Create a safety plan with your kids. Talk to them about what to do if the violence escalates or gets out of hand. Um, you know, run to the neighbors. You know, we have a, a, a little saying, who are the five? Who are the five people on your hand that you could talk to if something mm -hmm. happens? So safety planning, um, you know, avoid punishing physical punishments if you can of your children. Supervise their media time and talk to your child. These are all opportunities for us to be protective uh, parents in our children's lives. So uh, we thought that, you know, it was important for um, for parents to know that there's opportunity to make a difference in their child's life. And um, yeah, we, absolutely. we also have uh, a number of providers here at the Family Peace Center. We have 14 co-located partners, and I can tell you about some of those, but I'll let yeah. you know. Yeah, no, I just wanted to say that I appreciate those like very specific concrete steps that that parents or any guardian or adult can take in a child's life because I think the go-to is get out of the relationship or get out of the house when that's just not realistic for, for a lot of people that are experience, experiencing domestic violence. So I appreciate those steps that can happen even while still in the home with someone that might be an abuser. It's really a reflection that leaving is a process, right? That it can take a, a mo it can take a process for people to get out of the violence. And we understand that, but that's really mm -hmm. for people. And you're right, you can hold on to your kids and protect them and help them in the midst of, of the violence that might be happening. You also deserve to heal uh, in your own life if someone is hurting you. And you know it's important that your own, your own healing is so intimately connected to your child's healing. That's why it's important to get people in into services, as well as the abuser. You know, the the person who's hurting someone, they deserve to heal and get help as well. Um, so, and that benefits the child. Absolutely. So. Yeah. So, why don't you go into the, some of the services that the Sojourner Family Peace Center has uh, for children specifically? The other thing I want to say, you know, kids want to know that they matter, that they belong, mm -hmm. and that they're loved. And we, we should never miss an opportunity. We should all be shouting that from the rooftops. Like you said earlier, wear your mask so our kids can go back to school because they matter so much to us. Mm -hmm. um, children's Behavioral Health is here. They have clinic clinicians, uh, therapists who are on site providing therapy to kids uh, here in the Family Peace Center. We also have a child psychiatrist connected to Children's Behavioral Health here. So if someone is in need of that type of resource, we can connect them uh, with an appointment. We have Milwaukee Public Schools as a social worker here in the building. If there are school issues or questions, if you're a survivor and you wanna talk about uh, help you need uh, and schooling for your children, we have a social worker liaison here. Wraparound Milwaukee is here uh, through Milwaukee County. They provide uh, Medicaid eligible children and young adults, five to 23, who are in need of support with behavior or mental health needs. So. Um, they have a drop-in space here as well. Under COVID, it's not operating as a drop-in, but they certainly are available virtually uh, to make a connection. And then we have the Child Advocacy Center here who does forensic exams and um, on kids who have been suspected of being abused here in our community. Great, great. Thank you for all of those. Um, are there any costs associated with those services? They are no cost. And then addition, you know, we have Sojourner here. We provide uh, support groups for kids, support groups for families, moms and kids. It's a 12 week class. We have, of course, shelter kids with moms or dads. And we do academic enrichment, school support um, here for kids who are living with us. Awesome. Awesome. And so you mentioned too how you have services for for abusers who want to disrupt that and make change in their life. And I think that that a lot of times abusers were people who were abused. Right. And um, that just goes to show how, you know, a child who witnesses that can grow up to be somebody that uses violence as a way to yeah. uh, have control in a relationship. So do you mind talking about the different ways that domestic violence trauma can affect how a child operates in a family dynamic later on in life or even can affect the kind of partner that they will choose later on in life and what kind of behavior they'll tolerate from a partner? 
Right. Um, what you see in research and what we know from the work is that, um, you know, violence doesn't just go away on its own. It has to be addressed. Right. It will walk with you uh, throughout your life. When you've been exposed, you learn that violence is a normal behavior and you tolerate it and navigate your life differently if, as if you, you know, differently than you would have if you were not impacted by violence. We also live in a very violent society that normalizes and glorifies violence. And I think that's problematic for kids. But if you've been in a home, uh, in particular, if you've been a home or you've been abused yourself where those are co-occurring, it creates challenges for you. So you may be a child who uh, one of the ways of self-regulating is you become aggressive and you start acting out and hurting other people. When you begin your dating life, you might, uh, if you're an aggressor, choose someone who you can victimize because that's what you believe love and relationships look like. If you are, um, and mostly we see young boys becoming more aggressive, but that's been changing over the last 10 years. We have more young girls who have been aggressive in relationships. But it's basically you learn that controlling someone and being aggressive is the way to get your needs met. And you, mm -hmm. you repeat that behavior. And you could repeat it for many, many years in your life unless there's some interruption. If you are someone who in, internalized the violence and learned that you should, you know, that be becoming a victim, just is just the way it is. This is our love language. This is how men treat women or this is the way relationships go. You could be a person that, you know, connects with someone who might want to control you and mistake that for love. And right. you might be preconditioned because you grew up in a violent home. It doesn't mean that you will absolutely become a, a, an abuser or a victim. It's just more likely that, that you will have problems in one of those two ways as, as a young adult and as an adult in your life. Right. Yeah, thank you for that distinction and how the, the behaviors that develop in, in a child can then carry over. Right. Uh, because, yeah, just like you said, those those things just don't melt away with time. There has to be some sort of intervention or interruption for, for all of us. I think, you know, a lot of us as adults are walking around as wounded as well. Yeah, and, you know, definitely. I believe healing is a fundamental human right. And mm -hmm. uh, we have a right and a, a need to get healthy. And our children come along with us as we get healthy. That's so critically important. So again, I want to say if anyone would like this brochure, uh, I'd be willing to send a, a, a stack over to SOC. They yeah. can look on our website, which is familypeacecenter.org. Um, the most important thing I think is we need to think about what kind of resource can we be for children? How can I make space for children to be children, have fun, express their feelings, protect them from violence if I can? Mm -hmm. And uh, maybe call an advocate if you have somebody that you're concerned with, either here at Sojourner or the Latina Resource Center. Awesome. Thank you for that. And yeah, I really appreciate what you appreciated what you mentioned earlier, too, about letting a child know that it's not their fault or that it's not normal. I think a lot of human nature is just to cover things up and make right. it seem like everything's OK. And I think with children, we, we something a parent would do or a guardian would do would just let them think that it's okay this is normal you don't need to tell anybody about it right. but just having those five people would acknowledge like this isn't normal it's not your fault but you know we love you regardless we love um, you um i'm here to help mm -hmm. like i said i think children need to know they belong they matter they're loved and they're safe ultimately you know yeah. Um, so programs like LRC and Sojourner are really here to help moms and dads who are being victimized navigate their lives so they can get to safety for themselves and their kids. Yeah. I can't stress that enough. You know, we really need adults who are healthy, who can create protective environments for their children. Definitely. So you mentioned a number of services that you have for children specifically. What other services do you have at the Sojourner Family Peace Center? for families, whether for victims or abusers? So we have the uh, Child Witness to Domestic Violence Program. As I said, uh, families come together, they have a meal, um, they break out into support groups. We have, uh, there's a 12 week class. We have aftercare groups for them, for those families that have graduated that program, they continue to come together. This was pre-COVID to have a meal and then break out into 
uh, support groups. The graduation for that program, I love this activity. Uh, the moms write a love letter to their kids. Mostly we've done these for moms. We haven't had dads yet participate. Um, they write a love letter to their kids and they read it at graduation. So imagine, right? Most of us want to be loved desperately by our moms and dads to have your mom stand up and read a letter about what she loves about you. Um, we have a program called the Lullaby Project we do with the symphony. We partner our survivors with musicians. They write um, a lullaby for their children and we do a concert once a year. They write an original lullaby. So they create the words, the mu musician does the music and then the moms get up and sing their lullaby to their children. That's, uh, that's, beautiful. Also, that's a beautiful project. Um, you know, we have other support groups, weekly support groups, uh, educational groups, book clubs, lots of activities that people can get involved in. All of it is virtual right now. We hope to start up at the end of this year in-person services if we can, if we can get the virus under control. Lovely. And again, no, no cost associated with those other resources that you mentioned? Not at all, no. And, no cost for sojourner services or for our partners. Um, we also have Jewish Family Services here that provide uh, therapy to adults, adult uh, survivors who need mental health services. So um, we have uh, Project Ujima here. Coral Central is here doing Reiki massage and acupuncture. We've done awesome. movement classes with kids. We, pro we partner with um, First Stage doing some theatrics with kids to help them learn to express themselves. That's amazing. So we have lots of activities. We, we try to focus, we do a camp every summer called Camp Hope, where we take 60 kids away for a week and they learn um, nonviolent strategies. Uh, they focus on hope, uh, love, um, and they have a reunion a couple of times a year. So we try to give opportunities for kids to have fun. Yeah, definitely. Um, I'm just going to see if there are any questions for you here in the comments and just say hi to some folks. Um, okay. We have Diana with us, Maria, Stacy, Carlos. Good. Saying it's so sad to hear the way the ways trauma affects innocent children. Can you imagine how our children currently in the custody of ICE are being affected by their trauma? No. That's a whole other conversation, and it's horrible. It's it's, it's yeah, it's beyond despicable to me that we have kids living in those conditions. Absolutely. As I said, to me, it's a basic human right, safety and healing, um, mm -hmm. safety, and to tear kids away from their parents is unacceptable. Inhumane, unacceptable. Absolutely. Uh, we have Stacy saying some kids won't say anything. The aid they are scared to get taken away from their parent um, when them and the parent need help. Yeah, definitely. That definitely on that. Yeah, and you know we that's a that's a tricky line to to work with clients. So for for Sojourner, we are not mandatory reporters. So if a client calls us to report violence, the only time we report is if we if we suspect that child abuse is happening, that the child is being harmed uh, physically, sexually. Um, so we can have conversations and we can help moms navigate. All, all the domestic violence programs are not mandatory reporters. We do report, as I said, if we have a suspicion or if there's a threat of homicide or suicide. But other than that, a report is not mandatory. Now, some of the providers in the building are mandatory reporters for kids. And what we found is it's very important for um, moms to understand before they get into programming what those um, what that framework is so they can make clear yeah. choices. And, um, you know, we got to let kids express themselves um, and we need to be on the lookout for it, whether or not they're being harmed and um, give them an opportunity to talk about how they're feeling. And I think we can do that and not report unless we suspect that they're being actively hurt. Yeah, it's definitely. Well, thank you so much for everything that you have shared today. I just can't express enough that having those steps of how to make sure children know that they're loved and mattered, yeah. uh, how important that is. So thank you so much. Can you just let us know the best way to contact you? 
uh, the Sojourner Family Peace Center and any specific phone numbers or emails. Sure. I also wanted to say about the concern about reporting. There's a section on that in the brochure. So you can look us up at our website, which is www.familypeacecenter.org. Go to our website. All of our material is, uh, you can download it from our site. You can call us at our hotline, 414-933-2722. You can also cut our front, call our front desk and ask to speak to an advocate at 414-276-1911. You can text awesome. us. Um, you can email us through our website as well. Lovely. Well, thank you so much. That information is in the comments for people who need to follow up or want to get in contact with Sojourner Family Peace Center. Carmen, thank you so very much for being with us. And we look forward to having you on in the future. Anytime. Thank you. And we definitely want those flyers. So we will okay. we will work out with you how to get them. Yes. Okay. Thank you so much. Really great info. I also want to share this with all of you that if you feel unsafe now and need help for yourself, your family, or someone else in a domestic crisis, contact 911 for emergency police assistance, the National Domestic Violence Hotline, uh, where advocates are available to intervene in a crisis, help with safety planning and provide referrals to other agencies in all 50 states. You can call this confidential hotline, which is 1 800. 799-7233 or go to www.thehotline.org. And then also your local child protective services have resources for you if you or your children or both are in danger. Um, so know that those are options for you in addition to the phone numbers that Sojourner Family Peace Center uh, provided. Um, so we do also have another guest for everybody. We have Claire Evers with us today, who's going to give us an update on coronavirus in Milwaukee, the phase that we're in, and then any other important updates. So go ahead and bring Claire on for us. Hello. How are Hello. you? I'm well. How are you? Doing well, thankfully. Not very happy with how cold it is, but you know. Life goes on. Things are changing, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> um, but yeah, why don't you go ahead and get on into it? You're great at giving these updates. So yeah. just let us know what we need to know. Sure. So um, right now, Milwaukee County has seen um, just over 25,000 COVID cases. And there's been 416 deaths, and that's in Milwaukee County. Um, the positivity rate in the city of Milwaukee is at about 4.9%, which is the best it's been. Um, we have uh, reached below that 5% threshold in the city. The county rate is hovering right above 5%. Um, we are seeing a lower number of individuals getting tested. So I just wanted to put it out there that we are still encouraging anyone who has been in contact or has um, had symptoms of COVID to take advantage of our free testing sites. We have one at UMOS and we have one at Barack Obama School. And so we just really wanna make sure that we're continuing to get those testing rates up, especially with the kids being at school. Um, and then I can talk a little bit about our gating criteria. Um, so right now we still are in the order 4.1 for the moving Milwaukee forward phased reopening. Uh, we will remain in 4.1 until all of our indicators have hit the green um, green indicator, which is the best that it can be. So our testing indicator has improved. So it's gone from yellow to green while the other metrics have stayed the same. So we still do have two yellows in our gating criteria. Um, so the testing has continued to decline a little bit while the percent positivity has remained stable in the recent weeks. So that's how we have gotten to that green level. Um, it's important to remember that COVID is highly infectious and it, it affects all areas of the city. Uh, we want to make sure that people are remembering to follow the social distancing and mask requirements, as well as our hygiene guidelines to slow the spread um, and rate of the infection. Um, so the um, percent of cases in our African American population is about 32% of the total cases. Um, the zip codes that have been the most highly affected, um, number one is 53215, which is on the south side. So there's a total of 3,658 confirmed cases in that zip code. Um, the majority of that zip code identifies as Hispanic. 
and the neighboring zip codes 53204 has 2,408 cases and 53221 has 1,127 cases. So those are the second and third highest number of cases. So our Hispanic population has been the most heavily impacted by COVID since it was first observed in the city of Milwaukee. Um, that population accounts for 35.8% of all confirmed cases in the city of Milwaukee. Um, there have been a total of 600 or 6,567 confirmed cases among our Hispanic population. So now this group does have more cases than the African American population with 5,876. Um, again, when we look at our, our older age group of 65 plus, that is our most vulnerable age group, but now it's only making up about 9.2% of the confirmed cases, um, which is a really good thing. We're seeing the majority of our cases among our working age groups. So the 25 to 34 age group um, is 22.6% of the cases. Um, our hospitalization rate it has been stable. It's at about 9% right now. And um, as of today, there have been 280 deaths in the city of Milwaukee related to COVID. Thank you so much for those updates. Um, and then did you, oh yeah, you, you shared the, the death rates by age. Um, and then with cases, I know you you said that now the Latinx population is higher. Um, do you have the information on death rates by race? Uh, let me see. Let me look at our report here. If not, no worries. We yeah, can... I can bring that with me next time I'm on. Yeah, I don't sure. have the death rate by demographic on my report here. So I will bring that okay. next time I'm on. Awesome. Um, just interesting to see, you know, how that's different among the demographics. Mm -hmm. um, and then also just, we kind of wanted to incorporate how staying safe in different scenarios might look. So imagine like going to a nail salon, for example, mm -hmm. how might that look in the safest way possible? Yeah, so um, ever since we had the movie Milwaukee Forward Orders, we have specified for salons and spas specific requirements for them to be open um, while maintaining a really safe environment. So right now the salons and spas have a capacity limit of 75%. Um, or actually I think that might just still be um, one service provider per client to make sure that we're not, you know, um, having too many people in the salon or spa. So all the workstations have to be at least six feet apart. Um, and then we do have the requirement that only one client per individual providing services to the clients are allowed in the in the facility at one time. So there's no individuals congregating in common waiting areas for their appointments. Um, so regardless of any anything contrary to we have protective measure requirements for all businesses, staff mm -hmm. at salons and spas have to wear a face mask or cloth covering. This was even before the mask mandate and the mask ordinance. And clients are also required to wear a mask or face covering um, to the extent possible. We know that sometimes when you're getting your hair cut or if you're getting a facial treatment, you may not be able to wear the mask. So that's why we have it in here. Um, to the extent possible, masks are required on the client as well. Right. Um, we do require staff and clients to conduct a self-assessment for symptoms before the appointment. So again, those symptoms are fever, cough, shortness of breath, sore throat, headache, chills, muscle pain, or a new loss of taste or smell. Um, we are requiring that the chairs and workstations are sanitized after each use, and all appointments uh, must be scheduled by phone or online. So those are things um, on the business side that your salon or spa have to comply with. And then there's some tips for when you're going to a salon or spa. Um, you want to make sure that you're booking your services in advance. Um, you don't want to be waiting in a lobby for your appointment. Um, and you always want to make sure that you're social distancing. Um, before you go, you can call and ask to ensure that staff are wearing masks at work. Um, you know, in the city of Milwaukee, regardless of the state order, we have our city order for mask mandates. But in the surrounding areas, there is no mask requirement aside from the state one. So if the state one um, expires and you're going to an appointment outside of the city, you want to call and ask to make sure that they're wearing um, masks at work to make sure that there's that physical barrier to minimize your risk. When we talk about masks, you want to remember the mask is not protecting you. It's protecting those you're 
interacting with. So if you're going to have a service, you certainly want to make sure that your service provider has that mask on to protect you and you want to wear your mask to protect them. Yeah. Um, and then, of course, washing hands and limiting contact with common surfaces. You know, you want to wash your hands, use hand sanitizer right after you're receiving your service, before your service. If you touch any common things like um, if you're if you're working and you're sh you're touching the workspaces or the chairs, um, you just really want to make sure that you're washing hands and um, sa using sanitizer when possible. Yeah. Well, great. Thank you so much for that you know, visual of what it would look like to be the safest way possible at a salon or a spa. We really appreciate that. Um, and thank you so much for these updates all the time. We really value having you on uh, when you are on. So thank you so much. Uh, let's just make sure there are no questions. I am not seeing any questions. So thank you so much for your time. No and we will have you on in a couple of weeks. Sounds good. Thank you. Thank you. Always great info from Claire. So thankful for her presence on our forums. Um, I am gonna just take a second now to share some resources that we're gonna share in the comments um, about mental health resources. So this, like I said, is gonna be shared in the comments and it, as you can see, it's divided um, by topic. I guess you could say. So we have just generally community resources. If it's emergency, 911 for other resources or information, 211. Um, then it, it, there's just a number of resources or organizations or hotlines that are listed under each topic with their accompanying phone number on the right side. So we have intent of suicide, domestic violence, sexual abuse. Um, other crisis numbers for adolescents, alcohol and drug abuse, mental health. And I think that was the last one. Yeah. So feel free to explore this document. Again, it's going to be in our comments for all of you. And you'll see there's a number of phone numbers and organizations available for all of you based on what services you're requiring. And if there are any questions that come along with that document, feel free to drop them in our comment section or reach out to us at our email or message us on Facebook so that we can answer any questions you have about that. Um, and with that, I do wanna just share a quick video that I prepared um, that talks about the voting timeline looking towards the November 3rd election. So we'll share that for you. Hey everyone, so today I'm just gonna walk you through the voting timeline leading up until the election on November 3rd. So as you can see on here now through October 23rd, on top it says you can request your absentee ballot online or by mail. And under that it does say that October 29th is technically a legal deadline to request your absentee ballot, but it is not recommended to wait that long because we are expecting postal delays so if you wait until October 29th to request your ballot, you likely won't get it on time for it to count. Um, the next important date is September 17th. This is the day that the clerks have to send out the first round of absentee ballots that, um, that are already on file requested. So then the next important date after that is October 14th, which is the last day to register to vote by mail or online. And so now through October 14th, you can register to vote by mail or online. And then after the 14th, from October 15th to 30th, um, it's a closed registration period. So if you do wanna register to vote, it would have to be at the clerk's office at 200 East Wells Street, room 501, or you can also go to an early voting location and you can register to vote at early voting locations. Then the next important chunk of dates is October 20th through November 1st. That's when early voting will be available and then absentee ballot drop box locations will also be available. So you can register to vote at these early voting locations or you can um, drop off your absentee ballots at these locations. 
Moving forward then October 23rd, like we said earlier, is the practical deadline to request your absentee ballot online. And then October 27th is the practical deadline to return your absentee ballot by mail. So um, it says below that, that USPS, the Postal Service recommends that you allow a full week for your completed absentee ballot to be delivered. After that date, you should return your absentee ballot at a drop box because if you don't return it with a full week to be mailed, then it likely won't arrive on time to be counted. So again, if you have an absentee ballot, make sure you mail it by October 27th so that it has a full week to get to the clerk's office. Um, after that, again, October 29th is the legal deadline to request an absentee ballot, but you should not wait until October 29th. It's unrealistic to wait that late to expect to receive it and return it in time to be counted. And then finally, November 3rd is election day. So polls will be open from 7 a.m. to 8 p.m. Um, and on this day, if you still happen to have your absentee ballot, you must return it to a designated location by 8 p.m. And so we don't know exactly what those locations will be at this point, but we will make sure everyone is made aware. Um, most likely it will be the clerk's office downtown, um, 200 East Well Street, or the Election Commission Warehouse, which is on South Kanikanik Avenue. So keep that in mind. And these are the important dates to consider moving forward. And all of these things can be done. So registering to vote, requesting your absentee ballot, checking where your voting location is, knowing what's on your ballot. All of these things can be found in the link that is shared in the comments. So please look to our comments and go to that link to find out all that information and to do what you need to do to make sure you can vote in the November 3rd election. Thank you all for listening and I'll be back with you on another forum. Hey, so I hope that was helpful, helpful for all of you to know kind of the deadlines for all the things you need to, to know for the November 3rd election that will come up more quickly than anyone realizes. So if you had thought that you want to request your absentee ballot instead of going in person to vote, do that right now click the link that is in the comments and get that requested ASAP. Um, and if there are any questions about the voter registration process, the absentee ballot process, what all that means, if you can really even trust absentee voting, let us know. We want to clear up all the doubts that you might have. Absentee voting and voting by mail is absolutely a great option. It is reliable. Just give yourself enough time to get it back in time is all that you gotta do. Um, so now I will go ahead and share a census video and talk a little bit more about the census after that. Hey America, I've got something to say. Completing your 2020 census could mean smoother roads. Or more emergency rooms. Or more representation in our government. The census counts us all. And an accurate count helps inform where billions go every year. So don't miss your chance to be counted. We're kind of depending on you here. Complete the census online, by phone, or by mail. Shape your future. Start here at 2020census.gov. So we now only have 20 days left to make sure that we're filling out the census. And we posted on our Facebook today that you might be getting in your messenger inboxes or soon to be your phone inboxes, a link that will allow you to share the questionnaire uh, for the census. So it will take you to the my2020census.gov um, so you could share out that link widely to your contacts. So if you do see that in your inbox, please click it, fill out your census if you haven't, and then share that link with your contacts so that we can get those census tracts or neighborhoods on the south side and all over the city, honestly, that are still really low response rates so we can get those numbers up. Um, there are still some areas of the city that are under 40% responded, which means less than four out of 10 houses have responded in those neighborhoods. 
And that's just going to be terrible looking to the next 10 years of all the funding that's going to be missed out on because of families not being counted. So that's going to be something that might show up in your inbox. Uh, the census enumerators are out in the streets knocking on doors until September 30th. Um, if they do come knocking on your door and you think that you have filled out the census already, I would still answer the door and make sure that they have on record that you filled out the census because uh, you just want to be sure. So go ahead and answer that door. Again, all the information that you share with the census enumerators is private information. They cannot share it with anyone and face a very hefty fine, I think upwards of $200,000 if they share your information. And then the U.S. Census Bureau also is, it's illegal for them to share any of the information they get from any individual census. Um, it's used for counting, for distributing funds from the federal government, and for creating statistics. So please follow the census. Uh, we're going to be bugging you about it again for the next 20 days. There's 20 more days to fill it out. And let us know if you want that link so that you can share it with your friends if you have not received it in your Facebook inboxes yet. And we will happily send that your way. I'm um, just gonna make sure we don't have any other hellos or anything in the comments. Looks like we do not. So I just wanna remind everybody. Um, oh, I'm sorry, we do have another video for you from Drea about volunteer or intern recruitment. So go ahead and run that. Hello, my name is Andrea Rodriguez and I'm the Leadership Coordinator at Southside Organizing Center. I'm here today to talk to you about our Time, Talent and Treasure, which is our internship and volunteer program at the SOC. Um, if you're looking to contribute to helping us achieve our mission and our work on the near South Side, we would love to have you and have personalized something for you. Um, just to remind you, SOC's mission, Southside Organizing Center is a neighborhood-based organization dedicated to the development and sustainability of Milwaukee's near Southside neighborhoods. SOC works with and for residents to create a safe, livable, and economically vibrant community. SOC is committed to helping residents have a voice, vote, and vehicle act together in issues that affect them and to make positive changes in their neighborhood. We have a lot of great benefits of volunteering here at SOC. Here are just a few. Uh, perhaps you wanna to contribute to strengthening the near south side of Milwaukee. Maybe you grew up here, maybe you're looking to move back, or maybe you still live here. We would love to have you helping out um, if you're committed to the south side of Milwaukee. Uh, perhaps you wanna develop your skills, ability, or expand your network for any portfolio work. Uh, we're happy to help you with some volunteer work at SOC. Maybe you have community service or service learning hours with your local high school or college, or perhaps a workforce program that you may be involved in. We're happy to help personalize something to help you with that. And there's just really so much more. Um, if you have an interest in it, we can definitely align you for something, whether if you wanna work a few hours a week or a few hours a month, we're happy to work with you. Some examples of volunteering, and again, I want to reiterate, um, we are looking to make sure that everyone is safe with COVID-19, and we're also looking to make sure that we are personalized it for your interest. So again, these are just examples, but there are much more things that we could be doing if you give me a call or if you email me, which I'll say later on in this presentation. Uh, some examples could be doing a single task like mailing or doing some data entry for us. Uh, perhaps you want to do a project like Care Calls, where we check in with residents in our district, which goes from Menominee Valley to Oklahoma, and then it goes from South First Street all the way to Miller Parkway. Maybe you want to make some calls to make sure that they're all doing okay with C-19 resources, or perhaps to make sure they're counted for the census or whatever calls that we might have and have that week. Uh, perhaps you want to do some infrastructure work for us, working on our social media platforms or maybe accounting or maybe another area. We're happy to work with you. Uh, maybe you want to work on a specific program like our bilingual translations or working with getting housing information to residents or perhaps doing some resource workshops that right now we are doing online um, with various partners. 
Also, when we think about your time, we also want to think about your talent. There's a lot of incredibly talent peop talented people in Milwaukee, and we definitely have a place for you if you choose to take your amazing skills and volunteer at SOC. For example, our board of directors, our governance membership, or committee membership, um, we would love to have you join or to learn about nomination. Right now, we are growing our board of directors. Uh, we are very lucky. All of our board actually lives on our district, which again is Menominee Valley to Oklahoma, South First Street to Miller Parkway. So if you live in those areas and you're interested in being part of the board or learning about nomination, please don't hesitate to reach out to us. Uh, maybe you know something about branding or marketing or communications or public relations. We would love to have some volunteer work from you, even if it's just a day, a month, whatever it could be. I'm sure there's something that there's a need for us. Uh, perhaps you're with another organization and you're looking to do a collaboration or partnership or maybe do some coalition building on some certain is issues in Milwaukee. Happy to work with you. Maybe you're specializing in fiscal or finance and you want to help us in those areas. We would love to have your help. Um, if you are also specializing maybe in human resources like staff or intern or volunteering, we'd always love to have your, uh, your talent in that area or maybe you wanna do some organizational development and help us with some future visions. We would love to have your talents. Um, also treasures, we are run you know, by tax donations and also some important community partners, but we can't do what we do for the near south side without your help. So if you'd like to make a tax deductible donation, please don't hesitate to reach out to SOC at SOCMilwaukee.org or you can call us directly at 414-672-8090 if you'd like to make an in-kind donation. Um, if you would like to make out and mail a check, you can send it to Southside Organizing Committee, which is our original name, which is located at 1300 South Layton Boulevard, second floor, also in Milwaukee, Wisconsin, 53215. While we are not meeting in person, I'm also gonna have our person put in a link for an online donation, if you would like to do it that way. We would love to have any help from you. Even five bucks helps so greatly. So whatever you can give, please, we would love the help. Um, again, this is our intern and volunteer program, our time, talent, and treasure. If you want more information, please don't hesitate to call me, Andrea Rodriguez. You can reach me at andrea at sockmilwaukee.org, or you can call and leave a message at 414-672-8090. Thank you so much. Please, please be a volunteer and intern with us and reach out to Andrea. We're a pretty cool organization and lots of fun to work with, I think. Um, so now I'm just gonna have Marisol come on and talk about our survey. Has this live forum been informative and useful to you? What part of the forum could be improved or changed to make it better? Please take a quick survey that's located in the comments section so that we can keep three o'clock with SOC going for residents. Thank you for tuning in. All right, everybody, thank you so much for being with us today. Uh, as a reminder, tomorrow we're going to have an interview between Tammy and Dr. Monique Liston from Ubuntu Research and Evaluation. It's going to be a great conversation to witness and to listen to, so please tune in tomorrow and, um, and then have a great weekend after that because tomorrow's Friday. Um, but with that, I will leave you with a video with uh, thanking our funders and all of your beautiful people. Thank you to our sponsor, Wisconsin Boys, Community Development Block Grant, Neo Philanthropy State Infrastructure Fund, Mudman Board Project, Catholic Campaign for Human Development, Silver Foundation, City of Milwaukee Office of violence prevention, Thai Foundation, City of Milwaukee Promise Son, all the faithful individuals who support SAC through the personal donation. Thank you, thank you, thank you.